Hi, welcome to Digging for Truth. I'm your co-host, Henry Smith. In our program, we explore archaeological discoveries and their relationship to the Bible. Today, we're going to ex be exploring the life of one of the most infamous historical figures recorded and found in the New Testament, Pontius Pilate, the man who sentenced Jesus to death. Brian Wendell, guest, friend, pastor, and ABR staff member, is joining us today to analyze the historical and archaeological evidence for Pontius Pilate. Well, Brian, welcome back to the show once again. Thanks so much. It is always an honor to join you, Henry. Well, we're great. I always say it's great to have you, but you know, like I said before, you're becoming a regular feature of the program. We're going to have to <laughs> we're going to have to put a chair over here for you pretty soon. I just can't say no when you guys ask. Yeah, I know. I mean, it's kind of hard to come from Canada, but you know, praise praise the Lord for modern technology. All right. Well, Pontius Pilate. Most people out there have heard of him. Uh, he's the infamous figure uh, who's involved in the execution of Jesus. He, uh, he even makes his way into the famous uh, creed of the church, the Apostles' Creed, right? He was crucified under Pontius Pilate. Let's talk about Pontius Pilate. Yeah, well, Pontius Pilate is mentioned over 50 times in Scripture. And um, most of people, of course, know him from the incident at the end of Jesus' life. But there's there's an incident incident earlier in his life where Pontius Pilate is mentioned. And in Luke chapter 13, Luke records an incident where some people come and tell Jesus about this group of Galileans who had been killed by Pontius Pilate and and how Pilate had mingled their blood with their sacrifices. And uh, Jesus acknowledges, of course, that he's aware of the incident, and he uses it to warn people about the coming judgment. But it's interesting, when we look at, at what we see, what we learn about Pontius Pilate in here, we see, um, I think, someone who is, who is very cruel. Uh, I think we see someone who is intentionally going out of his way to offend the Jewish people. I mean, he could have just had them taken off and executed. But no, that wasn't good enough for him. He had them not only executed, but had their blood mingled with their sacrifices. We don't know what their crime was, but we get a bit of a glimpse into the psyche of Pilate with this, this unique punishment that he gives out here. Yeah, you know, I've always found that passage interesting because there's so much theology and warning in it. Jesus doesn't address the wickedness of Pilate, although I'm sure that asked the question, or at least given the context, he certainly sees it that way, but he's concerned more about uh, where people's spiritual condition is as it relates to eternity and the judgment of God. Be right with God, because you never know when your, your day, your, that you'll, the day you'll die. It's a, it's a dire warning, but a, a warning of compassion. A lot of people misunderstand it. But we can't explore that particular issue, because that's a whole other program, the, that, that <laughs> issue of of God's judgment and all that. Let's shift the discussion uh, uh, towards the crucifixion and the trial related to Pilate. Go ahead and build on that. Well, Pilate's interaction with Jesus and the Jewish leaders is really interesting to see uh, sometime later now um, in the chronology. And um, when, when Pilate interviews and interrogates Jesus, uh, Jesus doesn't initially answer him, doesn't say anything to him. And, and Pilate says, you won't speak to me? Do you not know I have the authority to release you or the authority to crucify you? I, I think we see here Pilate flexing the might of Rome that, that he has the authority of. And, and of course, Jesus replies to him simply, you would have no authority over me unless it was given to you from above. And, and then we see um, Pilate interacting here with the Jewish leaders. They've accused Jesus, but after interrogating Jesus, um, Pilate recognizes that there isn't any, there isn't a capital crime that he's committed here. He doesn't deserve uh, death, and so he goes out and tells the Jewish leaders that he finds no fault in them. And they, of course, respond that um, if you release this man, you are no friend of Caesar's. Everyone who makes him a king opposes himself to see, opposes Caesar. And then it's interesting, Pilate delivers Jesus over at that moment. Now, this is really interesting because it seems that something has changed here. Um, the pilot from earlier who went out of his way to offend Jewish people now seems to be uh, kind of a little worried that the Jewish people might tell uh, Caesar about him. Um, now, how do you explain this change in 
behavior. And there actually is some interesting historical things happening at this time that does provide a bit of a background for that. There was a, a man named Sejanus. Uh, Tiberius Caesar had gone into a bit of a, a semi-retirement. He'd left the kingdom in the control of Sejanus, but Sejanus wanted to be emperor and so uh, hatched this plot to take over and Tiberius heard about it and came back, had Sejanus executed. Um, and, and some people have suggested maybe that Pilate was appointed to his position by Sejanus and I'm not sure about that, but what's really interesting is that Philo of Alexandria writes about him. He says this, that matters in Italy became troublesome when Sejanus was organizing his onslaught, for Tiberius knew the truth, and he knew at once after Sejanus' death that the accusations made against the Jewish inhabitants of Rome were false slanders invented by him because he to, wished to make a way with the nation. And Tiberius charged his procurators in every place to which he was appointed to speak comfortably to the members of our nation in different cities. So what, what Philo of Alexandria is is recording here is that there was a significant shift in public policy under Sejanus, um, who was who was just violently anti-Semitic. There was great persecution of the Jews, but after his death, when Tiberius comes back, he sends out the word to say, "No, no, no, we need to treat these people uh, with respect and kindness." And I think this helps explain the change that we see in Pilate. Sejanus died in 31 AD. If Jesus died in 33 AD, as many people believe that he did, then that would explain how uh, Pilate's uh, attitude changed. Previously, he was quite willingly and quite happily, it seems, uh, carrying out a very aggressive public policy against the Jews. But after the death of Sejanus, it appears that he changed his policy and realized he needs to stay on Tiberius' good side, especially with Tiberius killing all the co-conspirators with of Sejanus's plot. Yeah, that's very interesting. So, so in a way, it's a it's it's of course Pilate is has a lot of authority, but he still has authority over him. And so politically expediency demands a shift in how he's going to be. So what you're saying is over here in the mixing of the blood, we have brutality just sort of unveiled. And then in dealing with Jesus as this dialogue unfolds, a little more contrition perhaps, perhaps a little bit different, not necessarily as, as, uh, as arrogant or as, as aggressive. But um, in the end, he ends up crucifying him. So, but for other reasons, we're going to explore that some more, Brian. This is very good. Thank you for those very particular observations, very details in the, uh, the evidence outside the Bible from Philo and from the text itself. And folks, uh, please don't go away. Brian is going to be sharing more about evidence for Pontius Pilate from outside of Scripture and how we can trust uh, the text and narrative of the New Testament. We'll be right back. In a culture of intense Bible-denying skepticism, Associates for Biblical Research exists to strengthen followers of Jesus by affirming the authority of the Bible. Our archaeological fieldwork and original research form a strong foundation in upholding the reliability of the Scriptures. For students or anyone asking if they can really trust the Bible, please visit our website and partner with us by joining our prayer team or financially supporting this ministry. And thank you for standing with us. Hi, welcome back to Digging for Truth. I'm your co-host, Henry Smith. I'm here with Pastor Brian Wendell, who's on the ABR staff and also a pastor in Canada. And uh, Brian's here today to talk about Pontius Pilate. And we, uh, we're moving our discussion into this second segment. We're going to talk about some historical sources, continue on that, Brian, uh, about this most infamous figure in the history of the Bible and the world. You know, Henry, I always find it interesting when I read about a particular uh, figure, historical figure in Scripture, and, and then I start to go and do some research and read about what else we know about them from history. And in many cases, um, particularly with the rulers um, that are mentioned in Scripture, we learn more about them in, in other places as well. So uh, Pilate, Pontius Pilate, was the prefect of Judea for about a decade, from 26 to about 36 
AD. And the Bible isn't the only ancient historical document we have that talks about him. Philo writes about him. Josephus writes about him. The, the, um, the Roman historian Tacitus ta- writes about him. Probably the earliest written description that we have of him is uh, from Philo. Philo describes Pontius Pilate as one of, one of uh, the emperor's lieutenants, he's called, and he describes him this way. He says he was a man of very inflexible disposition and very merciless as well as very obstinate. In Philo's opinion, uh, Pilate was exceedingly angry and at all times a man of most ferocious passion um, who had the habit of insulting others cruelly and murdering uh, people untried and uncondemned. Um, so, so Philo doesn't have a really great um, view of Pontius Pilate. J- Jewish historian Josephus adds to this, and he says that Pilate was sent by Tiberius as prefect to Judea and that he condemned Jesus to the cross. Josephus also records an incident where Pilate used sacred money from the temple treasury to build an aqueduct um, into the city. And when the Jews protested this this um, terrible misuse of funds, uh, Pilate had them beaten by his soldiers and many of the Jewish people died. What's really interesting is that both Philo and um, Josephus record incidents where the Jewish people threatened to go to Caesar and to um, and to tell Caesar about this cruelty and his insensitivity to their religious beliefs, and and how at times um, it appears that that Pilate even relented. Now, isn't this interesting in light of what we just discussed in the last segment that we see this same uh, picture played out yeah. not just in the Bible but also in other ancient texts? And so we see this Pilate as this man who was who tried to rule. Um, and impose uh, Rome's peace on Judea with an iron fist, and yet at the same time knows that he has to stay in the good graces of the emperor as well. And so he's he's doing this balancing act of being the Roman tough guy, but also recognizing that he better stay on Tiberius's good side as well. Yeah, yeah, it's extraordinary to get these little glimpses into the site. You know, I mean, we always have to take the the account like from some someone like Philo. Uh, he didn't know him personally, but he, he, he's a contemporary eyewitness, so we have to take seriously his, his uh, analysis of his character. And it certainly fits the, uh, the Luke's 13 narrative with the killing of, of, uh, of the Jews and, and the mixing of their blood. So, um, again, here we have uh, Philo, a famous Jewish philosopher, lived around the same time, uh, documenting uh, information about Philo. Let's shift a little bit again. Uh, with further evidence, you have some evidence from Tacitus, the Roman historian. Yeah, and Tacitus's quote might be one of the most important ancient quotes, not just about Pontius Pilate, but about Christianity and, and about Jesus as well. Um, he was a Roman historian and he uh, and also a senator, and he wrote uh, his probably his most famous work is his Annals, which he wrote about 116 A.D. And in it, he describes the Emperor Nero's response to the famous Great Fire of Rome and how Nero blamed the Christians for the blaze to deflect the accusations that people were making about him. People were suspecting that he himself. Um, started the fire. And so Tacitus writes this, he says, consequently, to get rid of the report, Nero fastened the guilt and inflicted the most exquisite tortures on a class hated for their abominations called Christians by the populace. Christus, from whom the name had its origin, suffered the extreme penalty during the reign of Tiberius at the hands of one of our procurators, Pontius Pilate, and a most mischievous superstition, thus checked for the moment, again broke out not only in Judea, the first source of the evil, but also even in Rome, where all things hideous and shameful from every part of the world find their center and become popular. And so we learn from this passage that that. Pontius Pilate was the one who um, condemned and crucified Jesus during his reign um, when Tiberius was, um, was the Caesar, and, and it affirms what's written in the Gospel accounts as well. So, Brian, tell the audience uh, what your best understanding of the most mischievous superstition is. What is Tacitus talking about? 
And that's a really, really interesting illusion, isn't it? Yeah. Um, people have, have offered different suggestions. Uh, I look at it and I think he's referring to the resurrection here, uh, that this, this superstition. Can you imagine what it would have been like for the Roman people to have all of these Christians running around knowing that Jesus had been crucified under Pontius Pilate? I mean, it's, it's public record. Tacitus is writing about it almost 100 years later, and but have these people running around saying that they met Jesus alive again, yeah. that he rose from the dead? Imagine how superstitious that would have sounded to the Romans. I think he's referring to the resurrection of Jesus. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I, I think so too. I, I mean, you know, it could be, it, it, but it's singular, you know, it's a mus- mischievous, so it's not just Christian practice, like commute. Yep. Communion, you know, they believe they're eating the flesh of this person, Jesus. But a superstition seems to me to be pointing in the belief of the resurrection. This is a remarkable hostile witness to the accuracy yes. of, of the biblical text and the preaching of the resurrection. Would you, I, I know you would agree with that, but maybe you could Absolutely. take about 30 seconds to build on that a little bit further. Sure. It's one thing people often will say of the uh, critics will often say of the New Testament writers, well, they're biased because they're um, on Jesus' side. They're trying to portray Jesus in a good light. But a hostile witness is someone who has no bias like that. In fact, their bias would be the opposite end of the extreme, and that would be Tacitus. And yet, interestingly, even Tacitus, a hostile witness, what he writes lines up so beautifully with what the gospel writers write. And I would suggest it does because it's true. Amen. Well, that's a good way to end this segment, Brian. Thank you. Uh, Friends, please don't go away. We're talking about Pontius Pilate and the reliability of the gospel record. We'll be right back. Bible in Spade is a non-technical quarterly publication published by the Associates for Biblical Research, written from a scholarly and conservative viewpoint. Bible in Spade supports the inerrancy of the biblical record and is a must read for both the serious Bible student and anyone asking if they can really trust the Bible. Archeological evidence, properly interpreted, upholding the history of the Bible. Subscribe today at BibleArchaeology.org. Hi, welcome back to Digging for Truth. I'm here with Brian Wendell today, and we're talking about Pontius Pilate. All right, Brian, we talked about his, some historical evidence related to Pilate. Now we're going to talk about uh, his name etched in stone. Why don't you tell the audience about that? Yes, the famous Pilate Stone was discovered in 1961 uh, in Caesarea Maritima, which was the the provincial uh, capital in Judea where, where uh, the Roman procurators ruled from. It was a limestone block and it was discovered near the theater and it had been used, reused um, in, in some steps in, in the fourth century. But, but on, on it were still visible this inscription that said could be reconstructed to read Tiberium Pontius Pilate, the prefect of Judea. And so it seems that this came from a building called the Tiberium. We don't really know what that is. It might have been a, um, a temple to, to, um, to, to the imperial cult of, of uh, Tiberius Caesar. But what's really interesting is that it affirms that Pontius Pilate was a historical figure, number one, but number two, that he was indeed the prefect of Judea. Sometimes um, Tacitus, for example, if you remember the quote from the last section, called him a a procurator. And that's because later in history, later in the first century, the the titles of people ruling in particular areas, the governors was changed from prefect to procurator sometime under the the reign of Claudius. And so what this shows us is that that, uh, Pontius Pilate was indeed a prefect. That confirms his title of prefect. Now, it's interesting that the gospel writers don't use either term. They use just a general, generic term, meaning a governor, someone who governs. So they're, um, they're accurate in how they um, do it. But, but this, is, this is amazing um, archaeological affirmation of a person who we knew from history, from the ancient writings existed, but now we actually have archaeological affirmation yes. of them and tells us a little bit about, about his position. Yes, excellent. Now, we, uh, that was discovered in 1961. Uh, we also have other evidence 
coins. Uh, in fact, in our previous dig at Kerbet el Makader, which we identified as I, there's remains from the time period of Christ, and we found coins with Pontius Pilate on them. Why don't you tell the audience a little more about the coins in general, please? Yeah, Pontius Pilate, we've, we've mentioned how he seemed to go out of his way to intentionally offend um, the Jewish people. And, and on his coins, he, he minted two types of coins, little uh, bronze uh, prutas. And on both of them, he, 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 on the one hand, didn't put any graven images. So he didn't go that far, but he slipped other little things in. He, he would use symbols that were not Jewish symbols, but symbols that were used in the Roman imperial cults. One had a ladle that was used by Roman priests to pour wine over their sacrifices. The other had a staff that was used by Roman priests to show um, their authority. And so even in minting his coins, we see him getting little digs in uh, to the Jewish people um, who were there. But we see these coins and they, again, uh, attest to Pilate ruling at that particular area uh, and at that particular time. More recently, there was a really interesting rediscovery in 2018. You see, back in 1968-69, they were doing some excavations at the Herodian and um, they discovered a copper ring and it was discovered in an archaeological context that could be dated no later than 71 AD based on the other things around it. And it was put in a box and put on a shelf like a lot of discoveries, unfortunately, are. And then it was pulled out in 2018. It was cleaned. It, it was photographed and analyzed. And here is the inscription, Pilato, Pilate's name on this ring. And uh, scholars have suggested that it, it either belonged to Pilate um, or that it belonged to one of his servants. So the grammar is interesting because it seems to indicate that it would be used to mark things that were sent to that person, to Pilate. And uh, so it might have been someone who was working for Pilate, collecting goods on behalf of the prefect of Judea and sending them on to him. But again, um, interesting that we have this these uh, archaeological discoveries sometimes that are that are made um, a long time ago and then sometimes that are rediscovered in in modern times and we're able to reanalyze them using modern techniques yeah it's uh it, it's fascinating how sort of re-looking at the evidence and with the modern technology and all that how much has been missed in the past um, we've experienced that a little bit at our dig at shiloh going back in old dumps and sifting through material and finding things that were missed you know, so uh, to try to show more, the, yeah, the, the ring was a, a fast, really a fascinating discovery. Now, Brian, we got, um, I'm going to give you about two minutes to wrap up the show. Uh, maybe somebody's watching the show for the first time and going, okay, why does this matter? A lot of people have watched the show before, but um, maybe someone watching for the first time going, hey, this message about Jesus and the Gospels, uh, why does, why does archaeology evidence matter related to that? Yeah, that's a good question, Henry. Uh, um, I think probably the way I, I would answer that is this. Um, people look at the Bible, and they'll often make the argument, you can't trust what's in the Bible because it's just a religious text. And one of the things that we often do at ABR is we try to show people that it, while the Bible may be a religious text, it's a it's a historical document as well. And people who make the claim that you can't trust it because it's a religious text seem to be implying that that just because something is religious, it's unreliable historically. You know? So beyond the 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 logic of that that is that is illogical, um, one of the things that we often point out is that. The Bible is historically accurate. When it describes Pontius Pilate, it describes him in a particular way. And when we look at other writings outside of the Bible, when we look at archaeological evidence that we've discovered related to Pontius Pilate, we see this beautiful alignment. We see this again and again and again in the world of biblical archaeology. When properly understood and interpreted, um, archaeology helps affirm what's in Scripture. And one of the things that I often tell the young people who I work with is if you can trust the Bible historically, if what it says about things is historically accurate, I believe you can also trust it for what it says spiritually. Yes. And at, the, at its heart, the Bible is this incredible story of God's interaction with humans, rescuing us, coming to save us from our sin. And 
And the crowning part of the story is Jesus' death for our sins and his resurrection. And Pilate is bound up in that story. Yeah. And the fact that it's historically accurate there, I think, can, can lead us to conclude that the spiritual truths that it teaches, the, the fact, the truth of the good news is accurate as well and is something that you can stake your life on. Brian, you've expressed it. I can't say any more than that. We hope that those who are watching will come to us saving knowledge and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for joining us today.